The Book of the Damned by Charles Fort. Part 8. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents. This is Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, and we are coming to you not live from our 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau. A little bit of a professional enunciating there for those of you who can't understand that intro. I have people saying, like, what are you saying? (laughs) Angels and demons and monsters and serpents. Uh, also, uh, meant I can't to say, even say it. I uh, meant to say it on the last uh, episode. Pro tip for those of you who are traveling: Do not let your mask end up beneath the pile of dirty socks in your suitcase. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pro tip: <laughs> I got to the airport and I realized at the Atlanta airport to come back home, and I was like, "Oh, everybody's wearing a mask." I'm like, oh, "I don't have my mask on." <laughs> and I don't have it, and so I had to dig. I had to open my suitcase there on the floor of the airport in the entrance, and I dig around, and I finally find it beneath all my dirty socks. <laughs> so that's what I had to that's wear great. all the way back home on the plane. Nice, yeah. So also, to, before yeah. we forget, uh, daylight savings time. Yes, update? daylight saving time. An update from episode two. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Someone's been listening to Snake Bros. <laughs> Uh, up there on Capitol Hill because they are apparently pushing through a bill. Well, at least the Senate has passed it for the U.S. I don't know if it's going to pass the House or if it has yet or not. Uh, Maybe it has, but the idea here is that the switching back and forth between daylight saving time being on and daylight saving time being off is going to end if they can get the bill through and get it signed. Uh, so which what which are we gonna get? We're going we're to have daylight. Going, the daylight be saved? daylight sa- is permanently saved. Okay. That's right. Oh, thank God, we <laughs> finally will save it constantly. Right. Constant. It's a constant saving. <laughs> right? Why would you turn off saving for half the year? It doesn't make any sense. Anyway, I don't care which way they do it as long as the yeah, clock stops changing. <laughs> it's a joke. It's yeah, <laughs> I completely agree. But people are like, why are we staying on daylight saving? Well, you need to save that daylight all year. <laughs> but you know, there's, there's, yes. So we will all be able to do magic better. That's the key, that's the goal here. Uh, but we just need to line it up so that the so that noon on the equinox is the, is when the sun is at its zenith. Yeah, this is a freaking seems, easy man. Seems easy. <laughs> I agree. It's fun seeing all the arguments for and against this. There are people who are complaining that they don't want to get off work and have it already be dark. Oh, my God. And there are people who are complaining that they don't want to send their kids out to wait for the school bus at night in the mornings. So there is resistance. Get your kids out of school then. That's right. So it's it, the public school is the problem. <laughs> Homeschool them. No waiting for school bus at night. That's right. Anyway. Uh, yeah, I'm all for this. Kyle's all for it. We here at we the can Snake Bros. Do magic again. That's right. We over here at the Snake Bros Institute are definitely for ending this ridiculous switching back and forth of hours. Yes. Uh, because nothing is being saved anywhere. No matter what you do with the clock, the same amount of daylight happens every day. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it fluctuates naturally. But. Right. Each day, that particular day of that year is going to have the same amount of daylight as the set that same day the next year. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. No matter what you do with the clock. So, yeah. Yes. Such an annoying, meaningless and pointless freaking Right. I'm thing. so I'm proud that this is actually that somebody's trying Finally to do enough something. people get fed up with some stupid yeah, thing that and it's, it's actually all, yes. getting rid of it. That's it's right. Amazing. And also it's hilarious how no one can really tell you why, why? it got started. <laughs> There's all this different crap about why, oh, it was businesses, oh, it was farmers, oh, it was this or that, oh, it was trying to save power during World War One. No! I'm a farmer now, and we don't need that. That's right. We don't need it. It's totally useless to us. That's right. In fact, it's really annoying because that day when you're, you know, when you're making the switch, you're like, oh, God, like, what? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. What exactly is happening? (laughs) And also, as, as a musician in the studio, it's also a really bad thing because, you know, we were like, well... We can work on this a little bit longer. It's not too late. And the next thing we know, it's 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> like, what happened? <laughs> we were going to sleep, finally, and, and GMA was like, dude, I figured out what it was. Yeah. It was daylight savings, savings. time. I was like, oh. 
Well, there so you go. Annoying. There's your there's your rock and roll and agricultural <laughs> update and everything all in one with the daylight saving time. Uh, so should we tackle Space Weather News? Yep. Uh, there, it there it is. Yeah. Space Weather News from spaceweather.com. More solar flares. This morning's strong M4 class solar flare looks like it was just the beginning. Active sunspot AR2975 continues of to flare. It's an AR. That's right. Since the instigating M4 event, it has produced an additional additional C3, C9, and M1 class explosions. So stay tuned for more flares. Uh, there's another story here about the solar tsunami, which we read about last episode. A lot of things happened all at once. Sunspot AR2975 uh, erupted on March 28th, producing a major M4-class solar flare. The blast propelled a solar tsunami through the sun's atmosphere. Uh, the tsunami was radioactive. It was Its rippling leading edge beamed radio waves towards Earth. Mm-hmm. Ironically, while the sun was turning itself into a temporary radio beacon, it simultaneously wiped out some radio transmissions on Earth. A pulse of X-rays from the flare ionized the top of the atmosphere over Africa, calling it, causing a shortwave radio blackout. Aviators, mariners, and ham radio operators in the area may have noticed fading and other unusual propagation effects at frequencies below 30 megahertz. Mm. Energetic protons accelerated by the flare and tsunami are now peppering Earth's uh, magnetosphere, causing minor S1-class radiation storms. Our planet's magnetic field is funneling some of these particles toward the poles where a second type of radio blackout is underway, a polar cap absorption event. Airplanes flying over these regions may find that their shortwave radios won't work during the transit. That's so they're all. getting vacuumed up by the hole in the very, poles up there? Very interesting. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's it's too much interference. No, it's get, the, the, no they're getting sucked into the hole. Oh, oh yeah, that's, yeah, that's exactly what it is. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Current conditions, solar wind speed is 450.5 kilometers per second. The density is an extremely low 1.9 protons per cubic centimeter. Sunspot number is high, 97. Uh, the, uh, spa- uh, the neutron count is 7.1% above the space age average, which is actually one of the lowest readings I think we've, I've ever seen. Uh, maybe it'll keep going down as, uh, cycle 25 goes up. Let's see. Planetary in- K P index right now is zero, very extremely quiet, but the 24 hour max was four, which was unsettled probably due to those flares, uh, and other things. So we'll see. Hmm. See what keeps happening here. That's your space weather news for this week. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, should we do crypto real quick? Let's tackle some crypto. Bitcoin climbing steadily for forty-seven thousand nine hundred forty-seven dollars and ninety-six cents, and Ethereum also climbing three thousand four hundred ten dollars and ninety-seven cents. Should have bought in a couple of weeks ago when it was down at thirty-six thousand. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Ethereum went really low too, mm-hmm. but I'm glad it's up. Yeah. Yep, my portfolio is looking nice. <laughs> <laughs> Send us your useless Bitcoin. That's right. <laughs> uh, right. What else we got? We got stories. We got uh, so skirps, and we got some emails. Yeah, we we're gonna we we're gonna take a look at this. Uh, I guess it was a couple weeks ago. The uh, Hiawatha Crater was definitively dated. Oh, yes. Finally, and for all time. That's right. So I got an article here. I I read the uh, the the paper. Uh, there's a lot of technical details. technical details in there, but thanks to Randall Carlson, I actually understood a lot of what they were saying. <laughs> but it's it's just there's too much of that for the for the show. So I got this article from Forbes. Hiawatha crater dated to a few million years after dinosaurs' extinction impact. Danish and Swedish researchers have dated the enormous Hiawatha impact crater a 31-kilometer-wide meteorite crater buried under the Hiawatha Glacier in northwestern Greenland. The dating ends speculation that the meteorite has anything to do with the Younger Dryas climate shift or the extinction of the megafauna about 10,000 years ago. Yes, the... What does it say? The speculation has ended. Ever since 2015, when researchers at the University of Copenhagen's Globe Institute discovered the Hiawatha crater, combining radar data with gravity and magnetic surveys, uncertainty about the crater's age has been the subject of considerable speculation. Could the asteroid have slammed into Earth as recently as 13,000 years ago when humans had long populated the planet? 
Could its impact have catalyzed a nearly 1,000-year-old period of global cooling known as the Younger Dryas? Could this climatic shift explain the extinction of the iconic megafauna, including mammoths? Question mark? Question mark. you got to put question marks on all these. Question mark? <laughs> Covered by more than 1,000 meters of ice, it is not possible to access the crater and directly determine its age. Based on ice thickness and rates of ice erosion, experts suggested that the crater was at least 12,000 to 100,000 years old. According to a news release by the University of Copenhagen, an analysis performed on grains of sand and rocks washed by meltwater from the crater site to the edge of the glacier, the Hiawatha Impact Crater is far older. In fact, a new study published in the journal Science Advances today reports its age to be 58 million years old. Dating the crater has been a particularly tough nut to crack, so it's very satisfying that two laboratories in Denmark and Sweden using different dating methods arrived at the same conclusion. As o such, On the sand that they got yes, from the river. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> As such, I'm convinced that we've determined the crater's actual age, which is much older than many people once thought, says Michael Story, co-author of the study. As one of those who helped discover the Hiawatha Impact Crater in 2015, Professor Nikolaj Krog Larsen of the Globe Institute at the University of Copenhagen is pleased that the crater's exact age is now confirmed. Oh, exact age. It is fantastic to know its age. We've been working hard to find a way to date the crater since we discovered it seven years ago. Since then, we have been on several field trips to the area to collect samples associated with the Hiawatha impact, says Professor Larson. No kilometer thick ice sheet draped northwest Greenland when the Hiawatha asteroid rammed into the Earth's surface, releasing several million times more energy than an atomic bomb. At the time, the Arctic was covered with a temperate rainforest and wildlife abounded, and temperatures of 20 degrees Celsius were the norm. Eight million years earlier, an even larger asteroid struck present-day Mexico, causing the extinction of the Earth's dinosaurs. The asteroid smashed into Earth, leaving a 31-kilometer wide and 1-kilometer deep crater. The crater is big enough to contain the entire city of Washington, D.C. during the impact high pressure and high temperature minerals like... Oh, I'm sorry. Washington, D.C., which normally has periods, but that is actually the end of the sentence. During the impact, high pressure and high temperature minerals like zircon formed in the rocks surrounding the impact site. The crystalline structure of zircon contains radioactive elements. As they decay to stable lead, the remaining levels of radioactive elements can be used to pinpoint the age of the crystal. The scientists extracted the zircon crystals from sand grains and pebbles washed by meltwater from beneath the ice sheet to the accessible glacier forefield. The sand was analyzed at the Natural History Museum of Denmark by heating the grains with a laser until they released argon gas, whereas the rock samples were analyzed at the Swedish Museum of Natural History using uranium lead dating of the mineral zircon. So, yeah, so they're in the... I guess no one's ever told them that glacial ice will carry lots of material yeah. from all over the... Well, in the paper, they talk about they're, they're, they're collecting shocked crystals. Okay. Right? So the idea is like, well, these crystals were shocked yeah. by the impact. Mm. And so by somehow... By this impact. Yeah, by that impact. And so somehow, uh, I guess they couldn't be... Have already existed and then got shocked. Right. I, I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, they're... Well, Martin, anyway. Dr. Martin Sweatman, who we've had on the podcast before, who has an excellent blog, martinsweatman.blogspot.com. He wrote uh, Prehistory Decoded, uh, and he tackles, also, a, he tackles a lot of these. He's also done an excellent series on his YouTube channel on the basically just uh, doing scientific reviews of yes, the of, these of all of these papers. papers on the younger dryas impact hypothesis. Yeah, really so great. he hasn't published anything yet specifically on his official blog or on his YouTube site about this that I know, but one of his hot takes basically on Twitter that I saw in response to somebody uh, archeonews.net posted giant impact crater in Greenland occurred a few million years after the dinosaurs went extinct and his response was Dr. Martin Sweatman says probably not. They probably dated an ancient volcano instead. If it's really that old, it's the best preserved impact crater on Earth by far. 
Yet it's been under an ice sheet for millions of years, which would have wiped it clean off. This is not really credible. Yeah, and that's 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 why it, it's interesting that the speculation in the beginning was that it was from 12,000 yeah. to 100,000 years old, yeah. right? They, they were looking at the, the, the structure itself. Yeah. And they, and, and they did eventually give a wider range. They said 12,000 up to 2 million. Like, yeah. So starting at 2.3 million could have yeah. started the Pleistocene yeah. epoch. Yeah. So I agree. So we'll, we'll, we'll watch for future conversations and arguments and debates yeah. about this. I think I, I looked at the Tusk website if, and he hadn't done anything on it. Yeah. Yet, but, but, you, I, but, but, but what you get, this is classic with all the younger Dryas stuff is yeah. like you get a paper and then everybody's like argument over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Every time. <laughs> so yeah, I'm 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 looking forward to seeing the debate play out. Yeah, uh, in the papers. So I'm hoping to see something on the cosmic tusk or from Martin Sweatman. I'd like to know, um, you know, what his take on the specifics of the paper are. Yeah, and in that vein, we should talk about this real quick because this is interesting. Um. Some of you might remember George Howard talked a bit on our show about his. He went out to the Tal El Hammam site. Yes, the God, you know the biblical story. Sodom, and it, uh, you know thinking it, it had impact proxies. Um, and and then there was a paper released, and then there was some of uh, tr you know trash talking by Boslo et al. Mark Boslo, who has uh, kind of been really against all the younger Dryas stuff. So yeah, this, this was the paper that was saying this site that could have been Sodom was destroyed by an impact and threw so much salt water from the Dead yeah. Sea yeah. up into the air that it rained down on all the surrounding land and yeah. like just made it, you know, just totally desolate. Made it un uninhabitable, salted the earth, yeah. basically, yes. Which is just, it's crazy because the, you know, the story and the myths is... Yeah, pillars you know, of salt. Scott's, yeah, yeah. Um, it's got the whole like don't don't look back because you'll turn into a pillar of salt. That's it's like right. This classic, yeah, <laughs> uh, mythological representation of that story. It's just so cool to me. So oh, it, and the, and nearby was Jericho. Yeah, and they're like the walls fell. Cramp, you know, yeah, it, it got hit by this shock wave. Yeah, and so we had talked a while back on the show about. Um, I read the story of Jericho. Yeah, the processional significance. And you're of like the, showing, okay, here's this group of people marching around and around yeah. the city, <laughs> yeah. and then the trumpets blast, and then the freaking walls fall down. Yeah, it's like, you're like this okay. is talking about a the yeah. orbital path of a of a you know a body out in space yep. that eventually comes down and just, ah, it's freaking awesome. Yeah. So uh, there was some interesting news about this the professor James Lawrence Powell. Apparently resigned from the uh, from CSI, which is the um, the what what is that? Oh, I have it right here. It's the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. So I have his notice, uh, an abstract of a of a response he wrote to Boslow's uh, paper. That because so Bob Boslow basically the paper was published. The published the paper was called "A Tunguska-sized Airburst Destroyed Tal El Hammam, a Middle Bronze Age City in the Jordan Valley near the Dead Sea," by Ted Bunch et al. There's your trumpet blast right there. Right, this is the airburst. Right, so. Powell has this. This is called Sodom and Skepticism. On September 20th, 2021, scientific reports published a Tunguska-sized airburst destroyed Tal El Hammam, a Middle Bronze Age city in the Jordan Valley near the Dead Sea by Bunch et al. This article became one of the most widely read of the last decade, no doubt in part because scholars had long speculated that Tal El Hammam might have been the biblical city of Sodom. In the January-February 2022 issue of Skeptical Inquirer, Mark Boslow published a rebuttal of Bunch et al. titled, Sodom Meteor Strike Claims Should Be Taken with a Pillar of Salt. I have published a response to Boslow here, and I have also resigned from the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, which publishes Skeptical Inquirer. See my resignation letter here, and I'm going to read that letter right now. Dear Kendrick, of CSI. I hereby resign from the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. Please inform the members of the committee of my resignation. My reason is the publication of Mark Boslow's re recent article in the Skeptical Inquirer. It violates nearly every tenet of proper skepticism as defined. 
by Sissy Cop and CSI. Sagan said that ad hominem arguments are irrelevant, yet half of Boslow's article is an ad hominem attack on a single author of the Tal Tal El Hammam article. Another 20% of the article casts aspersions on the volunteer and religious organizations that supported the research. Hyman recommends that skeptics use the principle of charity, yet Boslow falsely accuses one of the BEA authors of having a criminal record and strongly implies that as a group they may have committed scientific misconduct. He also uses loaded language, e.g. photoshopping, fear-mongering, masquerading, tampering, mishandling, and giggle factor. Worst of all, Boslow never evaluates the evidence for cosmic impact presented in the Tal El Hammam article. Thus, from the point of view of advancing both science and skepticism, Boslow's article is irrelevant. All of this is discussed in detail in a preprint here. If Skeptical Inquirer is to publish articles by members of CSI, should they not exemplify the best of scientific skepticism? Sincerely, James L. Powell. Wow, that's great. So props to him for having principles there. I agree that uh, you know there there was the the paper that paper that he's talking about by Bunch was ridiculed, uh, and Boslo was the worst of the ridicule, and so he's resigning from CSI because of that. I think that's uh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. All right, should we tackle some emails? Yes. Okay, I got uh, four today. The first one is from an artist. From Chris from Fort Wayne. Says, hey there, I'm a new listener, but after tearing through all of Randall's content over a four-year period, I finally found y'all. My absolute favorite podcast potentially ever was your episodes with Marty, 10 out of 10. Wow, cool. Ever since I've, I was a kid, I've had paranormal experiences, and having personal experience with this subject, his explanations ring true to me. I flirt mostly with ghosts and spirits, a few UFOs here and there. I swear it sounds ridiculous, but my girlfriend has caught ghosts on camera, and I have about a dozen incidents over my life that I can't write off. Anyways, I'm writing to you because I'm an artist, and my work is centered around these subjects. I'll attach a few examples for your viewing pleasure. My work is all about taking bigger perspectives on human history while also touching on the supernatural here and there. I don't want my galleries to think I'm a loon, though, so I keep that part on the down low. <laughs> I meet with multiple people specializing in different disciplines, mostly geologists at the local university to help research and spread the good word. Thank you so much for hitting on literally every topic I'm interested in, and you have helped fuel my art, so cheers. If you ever want to use my art, please, it would be my honor. Thanks, Chris from Fort Wayne. And yes, Chris, your the art examples you sent here are great, and I am definitely going to use one of them as the show art for this episode. Oh, that's cool. Shows the world and another world above it and a snake flying through the air in between. I mean, that's freaking <laughs> perfect Heck yeah. for uh, Book of the Damned and Brothers of the Serpent. <laughs> okay. Um, this one is from Trevor called Epi Episode 102 with Grimerica. It says, Snake Bros! Oh, man, I love the show. I have been going through the back catalog on your website. Such a great show, guys. But this es episode has me laughing my ass off. He's got Grimerica guys are cool. I love the community-building aspect of your show with all your guests. I'm from Peace River, northern Alberta in Canada, so those Calgary guys are only you know, 800 kilometers away. <laughs> I gotta contact them and meet them. Smoke a joint with them, maybe. I'm always hearing. I'm. I always hear that Alberta is the Texas of Canada. You guys are so funny. I'd love one day to join one of those contact the cabin adventures. Sounds like so much fun. I'm also an avid Wim Hof practi practicer. Loved hearing you guys doing that on the trip. I first heard Randall Carlson and Graham Hancock on Rogan's podcast, but since he left iTunes, you guys are now my number one. <laughs> <laughs> you inspire me to keep digging, keep learning, and keep straight. Uh, and keep straight into out the skirt tards out there. It's so cool who all these like-minded people find and support each other. Keep it up. Snacks! And maybe I'll even hear back from you guys. Peace. Nope, you won't hear back from us except on the show just now. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, thank you very much. And don't bother going and visiting Darren and Graham. Yeah. It's not, not worth it. It's totally not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> no, those guys are great. All right, this is from, let's see, Levon. And it is called Egyptian plus Mesoamerican Origins. Hey, bros. 
Let's talk about linguistics. I was plowing through the back catalog when a startling piece of information hit me. No one knows how to pronounce Thoth. You bros mentioned it might be spoken as Tehuti, and I was immediately drawn to the Aztec word Teotl. Teotl means gods. Teotihuacan or Teotihuacan is the place of the gods, and Mesoamericans called the conquistadors Atlanteotl or gods from the sea. After some Googling, I found the deep linguistic comparison of Egyptian and Mesoamerican languages, and it makes the same connection. So my mind is spinning around the idea of Thoth, or Tehoti, traveling from Egypt to build the great Central American pyramids. Tehoti gives his name to Teotl and becomes remembered as a civilizing god. It's impossible to deny the symmetry of the triple pyramids of Khufu, Khafre, and Menkare to those of the sun, moon, and feathered serpent, so we search for the connection. Is Teotihuacan actually Thoth or Tehutihuacan? That's great. That's really cool, dude. That's all I have for you today, bros. Keep on snaking from Levon. That's what yes, I'm calling it. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Freaking awesome. <laughs> Thoth Wakan. <laughs> Teotihuacan. That's it. Yes. Teotihuacan. Yeah. Really cool, man. Thank you so much. You're a freaking genius. <laughs> genius. <laughs> All right. This is from uh, Matthew. It says, hey, Snake Bros. Oh, it's called Cloud Busting. Hey, Snake Bros. <laughs> I found out about your podcast after I started watching the Randall Carlson shows on YouTube. I listened to another pod about this stuff. Uh, anyway, I, I love the show and the banter between you, Snake Bros. So far, I'm only up to episode 37. I've been ignoring all of my other stuff for the most part. 37. <laughs> In episode 34, you spoke of rain dances and cloud busting or smashing. When I was very young, my grandpa showed me a trick where if he concentrated on a small cloud for long enough, it would disappear. This was in the early to mid 80s. I don't remember exactly what he showed me that, uh, that but I don't ex remember exactly when he showed me that, but I used to be able to do it up until about 10 years ago and pre pretty much forgot about it until you talked about it. I tried today, but it didn't work. I will have my daughter try with me this weekend if we can get some clouds. I figure she's a good test dummy as she just told me she experiences sleep paralysis with sensations of dark figures nearby in the night. So I will take, I will take video of the clouds and see if it works. Thanks for your time. Snake Bros from Matthew. That's cool. No cloud yeah, I should try to get Soul to do it. Yeah, see if help, he can help you it. bust a cloud or yeah, two. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll try too, bro. Okay. We'll do it for science. <laughs> all right. That's all the emails. Great. Yeah. All right. We can stop this segment early. We'll stop the segment early and then we'll tackle Look at the Damned, part eight. Six. Back, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, forgot to m mention the watchers that are dueling right now <laughs> on the other end of the internet. Is this an album song, by the way? This is, yeah. This is a alternative instrumental for our immortality. All right, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, getting that one master. But what's up, watchers? We got we got the deep beneath his space station guy, and then we've got another guy who's. Um, no, I'm not sure. What's, I think he's in the chicken bunker. That's right. The chicken bunker. <laughs> That's right. I am in the chicken bunker. <laughs> and I'm uh, in, a, in a spaceport at the moment. Thank you, Brenner, once again for, uh, for having my back. <laughs> yeah, you're about to get on you, a... Bro. You're about to take off in a spaceship. That's right. Yeah. And due to G-forces, you won't home, be able to... Finally. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we appreciate both of y'all being here. Yep. And uh, it's always fun to see y'all um, fighting. Yeah. On the other end there. It's great. That's right. Gets, it gets pretty fiery in the watcher chats <laughs> when they're both there. Uh, it's a fierce battle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Shall we? Uh, well, let's, let's, should we, let's, let's go over this chondrite stuff. 
just just okay. a, it's a start here. I was looking through um because we had some questions on, you know, what exactly is a carbonaceous chondrite, and Fort Fort was questioning whether we should just go ahead and call it coal sometimes. Right. Um so it is true, basically, when I was reading through this, <clears throat> that this class of meteorite is it covers a very wide range of stony meteorites, some of which can have inclusions of metal, some don't. Um but they include organic compounds. So a general description here on the Wikipedia page for a carbonaceous chondrite. I'll just read bits of this. Sea chondrites contain a high proportion of carbon, which is in the form of graphite, carbonates, and organic compounds, including amino acids. In addition, they contain water and minerals. Wa they contain water and minerals that have been modified by the influence of water. The carbonaceous chondrites were not exposed to higher temperatures. So they are hardly changed by thermal processes. Now, I wondered what That's this meant. interesting because when it impact when it when it's going through entry, yes, it would experience high temperatures. But I guess by that time it's already a rock. Is that what the deal? Like, well, in, in, in other words, the forming of it wasn't right. So that's what I mean. I was I'm questioning here. When were they thinking it should have been exposed to higher temperatures? Like when during formation out in space. The or during be... uh, during entry. Okay. But the... this may imply that some of them come in rather gently. Ah. So they don't get hot. Now, ones like the Tunguska object, which Obviously was, a, get hot, which was yeah. a, yes, a stony meteorite. It exploded uh, because it was getting hot. And it came in, it came in hot, right? It was mm -hmm. coming fast. Uh, coming in hot. That's right. Coming in hot. There's a bunch of other stuff about possible formation. The reason they call them primitive materials or pre-solar minerals. Uh, some of them seem to have been formed during the explosions of supernova nearby or in the vicinity of a pulsating red giant before they got into the cloud of matter which, from which our solar system was formed. <clears throat> uh, another carbonaceous chondrite, the Flinsberg meteorite, provides evidence of the earliest known occurrence of liquid water in the young solar system to date. Okay, under the heading of organic matter, they show a picture of the Murchison meteorite, which does look a lot more like coal. It's a blackened substance. The CM meteorite Murchison has over 70 extraterrestrial amino acids and other compounds, including carboxylic acids, hydroxycarboxylic acids, sulfonic and phosphonic acids, uh, aliphatic, aromatic, and polar hydrocarbons, fullerenes, heterocycles, carbonyl compounds, alcohols, am amines, and amides. Amines. amines and amides. Is it amines and amines I know or amines, amines and abides? Amides. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they are interesting, and yes, they have amino acids. So they've got lots of interesting uh, organic compounds, complex ones in them. So that's carbonaceous chondrite. It's it's weird to think of liquid water, like I think it would be frozen water protected inside of it but it's it's so it's caught in but a matrix said, of stuff that they say is like so old that it's pre-solar so it's it said the, liquid water didn't it did it maybe it did say liquid water but anyway uh yeah evidence of the earliest known occurrence of liquid water not that it is liquid water but yeah yeah but i just mean that it's hard to imagine liquid water being anywhere in space. In that vacuum. Yeah. You know, like... W yeah. So something would have to... Some kind uh, of, uh, like, a high-pressure situation would have to take place in order for it to become liquid. Some, right? of, some of these chondrites source from other bodies in the solar system. Like, in other ones, they're, they're, one of them that's uh, listed... So it could, have been, it could have been a gravity well that the liquid water was in in the yeah. early solar system. Right, so like okay. it came from Mars when Mars gotcha, had water. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> but they also say sea chondrites represent only a small portion, for less, like 4.6% of meteorite fall. And there's no speculation that these were possibly, like, blown off bits of other planets? Yes, that's... Yes. So we are sharing. 
Right. The universe sharing materials. Sharing yeah, there's one in, I can't find the reference, but there's one in here specifically that is that is considered to be a Mars object. It would be cool to find an Earth object on Mars. Yeah. Like, you know, just a chunk of something that fell on, on Mars. That can, you know what I mean? Like, yes. Maybe it's a billion years old or something, but that it came from Earth during some impact event from Earth and rained down on Mars. Yeah. So there's a CH group of chondrites. H stands for high metal because CH chondrites may contain up to as much as 40% of metal. So you can see the cross section there. It's got all these metal metallic inclusions mm -hmm. in amongst the stony, coal-ish, yeah. organic stuff. That's cool. It's got, they've got a polished slice of it. It's got nickel iron chondrules, which have been age dated to 4.5627 billion years old. Mm. Uh, and then there's the CK group, the CO group. Uh, there's lots of these group ones. Uh, but yeah, some of them are recognized as being from other solar system bodies. So, so they, it's cool to think about like uh, that there's some place where life formed first in the universe. Yeah. And then that place, well, life ends up creating all these new compounds. Mm -hmm. And then those compounds become... Uh, I guess, interred into the rock of that planet. And then that planet it gets impacted by something and those compounds get thrown into space and then they end up seeding other planets so that those planets now have a jump start. Yep. Having these complex compounds that could make it easier for the, you know, if it was a random uh, occurrence that caused life to exist or something like that, right? Just going with standard model. Yeah. That they, it would make it easier for other places to yes. have that same yeah. sort of random occurrence, and so then the more of those that happen makes it e gives increases the probability of it happening in other places because yep. you got more places that are getting impacted and throwing up more stuff that's being shared and right. That's just cool. Life uh, uh, finds, finds a way. way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's tackle the book of the damned. The Book of the Gosh Darn It. Charles Fort. Um, the Book of the God Dang It. <laughs> so I'm, again, skipping many large chunks of this book, focusing and zeroing in on the accounts. Uh, so if you're interested in reading the entire thing for yourself, there will be links in the show notes to get a digital, physical, or audible copy. So last week, we kind of ended in the middle of the beginning of the parts about cup marks. So I'm going to back up a tiny bit just to get started here. So Fort says, I have been very much struck with the phenomena of cup marks. They look to me like symbols of communication, but they do not look to me like means of communication between some of the inhabitants of this earth and other inhabitants of this earth. Cup. Cup. Okay. Yes. As in teacup. My own impression is that some external force has marked with symbols rocks of this earth from far away. I do not think that cup marks are inscribed communications among different inhabitants of this earth because it seems too unacceptable that inhabitants of China, Scotland, and America should all have conceived of the same system. Cup marks are strings of cup-like impressions in rocks. Sometimes there are rings around them, and sometimes they have only semicircles. Great Britain, America, France, Algeria, Circassia, Palestine. They're virtually everywhere except in the far north, I think. In China, cliffs are dotted with them. Upon a cliff near Lake Como, there is a maze of these markings. In Italy and Spain and India, they occur in enormous numbers. Given that a force, say, like electric force, could from a distance mark such a substance as rocks, as seen from a distance of, of hundreds of miles, selenium can be marked by telephotographers, but I am of two minds. The lost explorers from somewhere, and an attempt from somewhere, to communicate with them. So, a frenzy of showering of messages towards this earth in the hope that some of them would mark rocks near the lost explorers. So he's just making up scenarios here. 
or that somewhere upon this earth there is an especial rocky surface, or receptor, or polar construction, or a steep conical hill, upon which for ages have been received messages from some other world, but that at times messages go astray and mark substances perhaps thousands of miles from this receptor. <laughs> That perhaps forces behind the history of this earth have left upon the rocks of Palestine and England and India and China records that may someday be deciphered of their misdirected instructions to certain esoteric ones, the Order of Freemasons or the Jesuits. So again, he's going conspiracy here and saying that like the Freemasons or the Jesuits or somebody here is in communication with something outside of this planet and have been for a long time. I emphasize the row formation of cup marks. Professor Douglas in the Saturday Review, November 24th of 1883, says, Whatever may have been their motive, the cup markers showed a decided liking for arranging their sculpturings in regularly spaced rows. That cup marks are an archaic form of inscription was first suggested by Canon Greenwell many years ago. That the Braille system of raised dots is an inverted arrangement of cup marks. Also that there are strong resemblances to the Morse code. But no tame and systematized archaeologist can do more than casually point out resemblances and merely suggest that strings of cup marks look like messages. Because China, Switzerland, Algeria, America... If messages they be, there seems to be no escape from attributing one origin to them. And then, if messages they be, I accept one external origin to which the whole surface of this earth was accessible for them. So he's not considering the possibility of a precursor. That's right. I would just say precursor. Yeah. And I think we kind of mentioned this on the last episode with GMA. When we got into the beginning of this, I was just like, so this is, again, a... Uh, he's ex- accepting the standard model of archaeology right. in some yeah. form. Yes. Something else that we emphasize, that rows of cup marks have often been likened to footprints. But in this similitude, their unlinear or unilinear arrangement must be disregarded. Of course, often they're mixed up in every way, but arrangement in single lines is very common. It is odd that they should so often be likened to footprints. I suppose there are exceptional cases, but unless it's something that hops on one foot, or a cat going along a narrow fence top, I don't think of anything that makes footprints one directly ahead of another. A cop in a station house walking a chalk line, perhaps. <laughs> Upon the witch's stone near Ratho in Scotland, there are 24 cups, varying in size from one and a half to three inches in diameter, arranged in approximately straight lines. Locally, it is explained that these are tracks of dog's feet. Similar marks are scattered bewilderingly across all around the witch's stone, like a frenzy of telegraphing, or like messages repeating and repeating, trying to localize differently. In Inverness Shire, cup marks are called fairies' footmarks. At Valna's Church in Norway and St. Peter's, there are such marks said to be horses' hoof prints. The Rocks of Clare, Ireland, are marked with prints supposed to have been made by a mythical cow. We now have such a ghost of a thing that I'd not like to be interpreted as offering it as a datum. It simply illustrates what I mean by the notion of symbols, like cups or like footprints, which, if like those of horses or cows, are the reverse of or the negatives of cups, of symbols that are regularly received somewhere upon this earth, a steep conical hill somewhere, I think, but that have often alighted in the wrong places, considerably to the mystification of persons waking up some morning to find them on formerly blank spaces. Why does it have to be a steep conical hill? I don't understand. <laughs> what is he? He's referring to something yeah. like that. An ancient record, still worse, an ancient Chinese record of a courtyard of a palace and dwellers of the palace waking up one morning finding the courtyard marked with tracks like the footprints of an ox, and they suppose that the devil did it. <laughs> so, yeah, there are, he... there are stories like that where people find these strange circular footprints in the ground after, you know, you just wake up in the morning and there's like a line of footprints. But, yeah, the cup marks are... Uh, I'd say the biggest cup marks I've ever seen are in uh, Peru, mm-hmm. right? Like the... The Band of Holes. The Band of Holes. Yeah, yep. 
Transmission uh, was right. magnified too great. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and in the wrong place. <laughs> So the and then later are... peoples find it and use them, use some of them as burial places. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the watchers are showing us some cut marks here. I'm sure those of you who live in the UK are familiar with these. They're spread out all over the place there. Okay. Chapter 16. Angels. Hordes upon hordes of them. Beings massed like the clouds of souls or the commingling whiffs of spirituality. Or the exhalation of soul exhalations of souls that Doré pictured so often. It may be that the Milky Way is a composition of stiff, frozen, finally static, absolute angels. We shall have data of little Milky Ways moving swiftly, or data of hosts of angels not absolute or still dynamic. I suspect myself that the fixed stars are really fixed, and that the minute motions said to have been detected in them are illusions. That's an interesting thing. I think that the fixed stars are absolutes. Their twinkling is only the interpretation by an, an intermediatist state of them. I think that soon after Le Verrier died, a new fixed star was discovered. That if Dr. Gray had stuck to his story of the thousands of fishes from one pail of water, had written upon it, lectured upon it, taken to street corners to convince the world that, whether conceivable or not, his explanation was the only true explanation had thought of nothing but this last thing at night and first thing in the morning, his obituary, another Nova, reported in monthly notices. What, I don't understand what he's saying there. Well, he's, he's, just, he's just talking about fixed stars, and he thinks that they are actually fixed, that they don't change. And then he's giving this offhanded reference to uh, somebody who saw a Nova. A new star. And that he should have preached it from street corners, like the story of the fishes, the mm -hmm. multiplying fishes and bread. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's weird. <laughs> I think that Milky Ways of an inferior or dynamic order have often been seen by astronomers. Of course, it may be that the phenomena that we shall now consider are not angels at all. We are simply feeling around, trying to find out what we can, can accept. Some of our data indicate hosts of rotund and complacent tourists in interplanetary space, but then data of long and lean and hungry ones. I think that there are, out in interplanetary space, super Tamerlanes at the head of hosts of celestial, celestial ravagers. So I looked this up. I think Tamerlane. Tamerlanes? Tamerlane, yeah, was a... Uh, let's see if I can get to it. I did look this What's up. What's a Tamerlane? Tamerlane <laughs> was the ferocious and terrifying founder of the Timurid Empire of Central Asia. Throughout history, few names have inspired such terror as his. Okay. So he's so Fort is just using that as a reference, saying that there are hosts of mean, terrifying, terrifying uh, armies out in space. Mm. Does he get into? Uh, Crop circles at all in here, or is that not a... I haven't seen any yet. Okay. I can't remember. I've, I don't know if he dives into crop circles in this book or in later ones. Mm. So, yes, Super Tamerlanes at the heads of hosts of celestial ravagers, which have come here and pounced upon civilizations of the past, cleaning them up all but their bones, temples, and monuments, for which later historians have invented exclusionist histories. <laughs> But if something now has a legal right to us and can enforce its proprietorship, they've been warned off. It's the way of all exploitation. I should say that we're now under cultivation, that we're conscious of it, but have the impertinence to attribute it all to our own nobler and higher instincts. So again, he's going Bramley he's going there. all Bramley. Yeah. Bramley was going all for That's right. Or the year 1491. And a European looking westward over the ocean, his feeling that that suave western droop was unbreakable, that gods of regularity would not permit that smooth horizon to be disturbed by coasts or spotted with islands. The unpleasantness of even contemplating such a state, wide, smooth west, so clean against the sky, spotted with islands, geographic leprosy. So he's again, he's thinking of, you know, somebody... A European standing on their west coast, looking west out over the Atlantic and thinking, it just goes on forever. It's smooth and flat. There's no lands that way. Hmm. 
but coasts and islands and Indians and bison. In the seemingly vacant west, lakes and mountains and rivers, one looks up at the sky, the relative homogeneity of the relatively unexplored, and one thinks only of a few kinds of phenomena. But the acceptance is forced upon me that there are modes and modes and modes of interplanetary existence, things as different from planets and comets and meteors as Indians are from bison and prairie dogs, a supergeography or celestiography of very stagnant regions, but also of super Niagara's and ultra Mississippi's, a super sociology, voyagers and tourists and ravagers, the hunted and the hunting, the super mercantile, the super piratic and the super evangelical. Hmm. So he's comparing that European looking out at yeah. the Atlantic to us looking up in space. Yeah. And thinking there's nothing out there but right. a bunch of burning balls of mass. That's right. <laughs> he's and like, rocks. Nope. <laughs> in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, volume 11, there is a, rever a letter from the Reverend W. Reed. That upon the 4th of September, 1851, at 9.30 a.m., he had seen a host of self-luminous bodies passing the field of his telescope some slowly and some rapidly. They appeared to occupy his own several degrees in breadth. The direction of most of them was due east to west, but some moved from north to south. Their numbers were tremendous, and they were observed for six hours. Hmm. Editor's note. May not these appearances be attributed to an abnormal state of the optic nerves of the observer? <laughs> In monthly notices, volume 12, Mr. Reed answers that he had been a diligent observer with instruments of a superior order for about 28 years. Quote, but I have never witnessed such an appearance before, unquote. As to illusion, he says that two other members of his family had seen these objects, and thus the editor withdraws his, his suggestion. <laughs> so we know what to expect. If Mr. Reed saw a migration of dissatisfied angels numbering millions, they must merge away at least subjectively with commonplace terrestrial phenomena. Of course, disregarding Mr. Reed's probable familiarity of 28 years duration with the commonplaces of terrestrial phenomena. So he's just pointing out there that a 28-year observer, Mr. Reed, a diligent one with superior optics, would know the commonplace stuff for the most part would see the commonplace right so he would know like at, at, in 28 years of observing i've never seen something like this ever right monthly notice is volume 12 letter from reverend wr dawes that he had seen similar objects and in the month of september but that they were nothing but seeds floating in the air it was the black night satellite <laughs> in the report of the british association 1852 there is a communication from mr reed to professor baden powell that the objects that had been seen by him and mr dawes were not similar he denies that he had seen seeds floating in the air there had been little wind and that had come from the sea where seeds would not likely be to have an origin the, the except for a water spout yeah could and be that raining seeds the objects that he had seen were round and sharply defined and with none of the feathery appearance of thistledown. He then quotes from a letter from C.B. Chalmers, fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, who had seen a similar stream, a procession, or migration, except that some of the bodies were more elongated or lean and hungry than globular. He might have argued for 65 years. He'd, Im he'd have impressed nobody of importance. The super motif or dominant of his era was exclusionism, and the notion of seeds in the air assimilates with due disregards with that dominant. So there you go. That's damned. damned. Yes, it's damned. And the disregard, he's like, they, they will latch on to an explanation, even if it requires them to disregard a bunch of the details. Yeah. Even if it requires them to actually disregard some of their own rules. Right. That's right. Or pageantries here upon our earth and things looking down upon us, and the crusades were only dust clouds, and the glints of the sun on shining armor were only particles of mica in those dust clouds. <laughs> <laughs> snarky. <laughs> Very snarky. <laughs> Professor Coffin, in the Journal of the Franklin Institute, Volume 88, said that during the eclipse of August in 1869, he had noticed the passage across his telescope of several bright flakes resembling thistle blows floating in the sunlight, 
but the telescope was so focused that if these things were distinct, they must have been so far away from this Earth that the difficulties of orthodoxy remain as great one way or another, no matter what we think they were. And they were well-defined, says Professor Coffin. Henry Waldner. So in other words, if they were seeds, they would have to be close. And if they were close, they would be fuzzy. Right. They would have just been indistinct blobs. But he was seeing distinct things that looked like thistledowns, but he was focused with his telescope. It implies they are out in space. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Henry Waldner in Nature said that April 27th, 1860. What? I wonder what a thistledown looks like. Isn't that the. Yeah, look it up. Uh, Watcher? Watchers. April 27th, 1863, Henry Waldner had seen great numbers of small shining bodies passing from west to east. He had notified Dr. Wolf of the Observatory of Zurich, who had convinced himself of this strange phenomenon. Dr. Wolf had told him that similar bodies had, seen, had been seen by Signor Capocci of the Capodimonte Observatory at Naples, March 11th in 1845. The shapes were of great diversity or maybe different aspects of similar shapes. Appendages were seen on some of them. We are told that some were star-shaped with transparent appendages. So again, we, this is why he's kind of tongue-in-cheek referring to angels in the sky. Yeah, they're th- okay, that's it. The thistle down. Those uh, dandelion things. Right? That's what I thought of. Those things are very fuzzy. <laughs> but I mean... <clears throat> it's like, so there's like a middle point, like the actual seed, and then there's all the little hairs that come Yeah, they're, they're spindle-shaped with hairs coming so off them. So he's seeing that in focus yeah. in his telescope. Yeah. What the heck is that? Yeah. That's weird. So a host of small bodies, black this time, were seen by astro- by the astronomers Herrick, Bies Ballot, and Decoupe. Decoupe. Uh, vast numbers of bodies that were seen by M. Lamy to cross the moon. Another instance of dark bodies, prodigious numbers of dark spherical bodies pre- uh, reported by Messier in June 17, 1777. A consider- this is just a whole list of these. Considerable number of luminous bodies which appear to move out from the sun in diverse directions seen at Havana during eclipse of the sun, May 15th, 1836, by Professor Auber. M. Bowie cites a similar instance in August 3rd, 1886. Uh, M. Lotard's opinion that they were birds and there's a large number of small bodies crossing the disk of the sun, some swiftly, some slowly, most of them globular, but some seemingly triangular, and some of more complicated structure, seen by M. Trouvelet, who, whether seeds, insect, birds, or other commonplace things, had never seen anything resembling these forms, he said. There's a report from the Rio de Janeiro Observatory of vast numbers of bodies crossing the sun, some of them luminous and some of them dark, from sometime in December of 1875 until January of 1876. So I wonder if uh, modern astronomers see this type of stuff and they have like an explanation for it. Yeah, it's possible. Very possible. But mo- a lot of our sun observatories now are just out in space. So, and then there and are anomalies all the time. Yeah, and then there are anomalies that cross the sur- the face of the sun, even from those. Yeah, out in space observatories. I just wonder what their explanation for it is now. It's like, oh, you know, there's no there's a bunch of rocks a, and stuff floating around. Oh out yeah, there. it was a glitch in the uh, optics. You know, it was a bad pixel. <laughs> <laughs> or I guess the. More often used explanation is that it's a uh, cosmic ray causing a bad pixel. Letter from Sir Robert Inglis to Colonel Sabine in the report of the British Association in 1849 says that at 3 p.m. August 8th in 1849 in Switzerland, Inglis had seen thousands and thousands of brilliant white objects like snowflakes in a cloudless sky. Though this display lasted about 25 minutes, not one of these seeming snowflakes was seen to fall. Inglis says that his servant fancied that he had seen some something like wings on these, whatever they were. 
On page 18 of this report, Sir John Herschel says that in 1845 or 46, his attention had been attracted by objects of considerable size in the air, seemingly not far away. He had looked at them through the telescope. He says that they were masses of hay, not less than a yard or two in diameter. Still, there are some circumstances that interest me. He says that no less than a whirlwind could have sustained these masses, but the air about him was calm. No doubt wind prevailed at the spot, but there was no roaring noise, he said. None of these masses fell within his observation or knowledge. To walk a few fields away and find out more would seem not much to expect from a man of science, but it is one of our superstitions that such a seeming trifle is just what, by the spirit of an era, we'll call it, one is not permitted to do. If those things were not masses of hay, and if Herschel had walked a little and found out, and had reported that he had seen strange objects in the air, that report in 1846 would have been as misplaced as the appearance of a tail upon an embryo still in its gastrula era. I have noticed this inhibition in my own case many times. Looking back, why didn't I do this or that little thing that would have cost so little and have meant so much? <laughs> didn't belong to that era of my own development. <laughs> Ah, oh, it's break time. Oh, yeah. Well, it is time. Time flies. In the cube. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, Brothers of the Servant Podcast, second half of the show, second hour. Still going through Charles Fort's Book of the Damned, and I actually don't know how much is left in the book because this edition I have is all four of them. It has all the notes. Oh, it's all four. All four books. Gotcha. So according to it, we are only 18% of the way through, so I don't know how much uh, of Book of the Damned we're actually through here. Well, we'll just hope there's 25% in that first book. <laughs> Also, it's uh, Jeff's birthday on the day that we're recording this. Happy birthday, Happy buddy. Happy birthday, buddy. The old saucy Jefferman. That's right. Jeff Saucerman, which means that his ancestors probably came from a UFO yeah. at some point. <laughs> Saucerman. <laughs> All right. In Germany, about half an hour before sunrise, March 22nd, 1880, an enormous number of luminous bodies rose from the horizon, passed in a horizontal direction from east to west. They are described as having appeared in a zone or belt, and they shone with a remarkably brilliant light. So, Fort says, they've thrown lassos over our own data to bring them back to Earth, but they're lassos that cannot tighten. We can't pull out of them. We may step out of them or lift them off, some of us used to have an impression of science sitting in calm and just judgment. Some of us now feel that a good many of our data have been lynched. If a crusade, perhaps from Mars to Jupiter, occurs in the autumn, there are seeds. If a crusade or outpouring of celestial vandals is seen from this earth in the spring, it's ice crystals. If we have a record of, of a race of aerial beings, perhaps with no substantial habitat, and is seen by someone in India, it's locusts. This will be disregarded. If locusts fly high, they freeze and fall in the thousands. In Nature, Volume 47, locusts that were seen in the mountains of India at a height of 12,750 feet in swarms and dying by the thousands. But no matter whether they fly high or fly low, no one ever wonders what's in the air when locusts are passing overhead because of the falling of stragglers. I have especially looked this matter up no mystery. When locusts are flying overhead, there is a constant falling of stragglers. Monthly Notices, Volume 30. An unusual phenomenon noticed by Lieutenant Herschel, October 17th and 18th, 1870, while observing the sun at Bangalore in India. Lieutenant Herschel had noticed dark shadows crossing the sun, but away from the sun there were luminous, moving images. For two days, bodies passed in a continuous stream, varying in size and velocity. 
The lieutenant tries to explain, as we shall see, but he says, As it was, the continuous flight, for two whole days, in such numbers, in the upper regions of the air, of beasts that left no stragglers, is a wonder of natural history, if not of astronomy. He tried different focusing. He saw wings. Perhaps he saw planes. He says that he saw upon the objects either wings or phantom-like appendages. And then he saw something that was so bizarre that in the fullness of his 19th century-ness, he writes, There was no longer doubt they were locusts or flies of some sort, because one of them had paused, it had hovered, and then it had whisked off. The editor says that at that time, countless locusts had descended upon certain parts of India. So I think what Fort's trying to point out here is that in most known locust passages, migrations, whatever, where there's tons of them, they're constantly falling to the ground. Stragglers, they call them. Mm -hmm. But in this case, Herschel was in was viewing something that was way farther than most locust swarms are seen to fly. Way, way up there. He used his telescope to look at them. There were no stragglers falling. He sees one pause, hover, and then whisk off, very UFO-like. Mm -hmm. And they decide that it must be locusts. So I don't know. Man, that must have been really hard to uh, try to focus on them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because you're also there. There would be depth to yeah. them, right? right? So you're you you might be able to adjust the focus and gather, like focus in on a few, but then they're moving across the lens. Yeah. It's like that's right. How do you? That would be really difficult. At the observatory of Zacatecas in Mexico, I don't know if I'm saying that right, August 12, 1883, about 2,500 meters above sea level, were seen a large number of luminous small bodies entering upon the disk of the sun. M. Bonilla telegraphed to the observatories of the city of Mexico and Puebla. Word came back that the bodies were not visible there because of this parallax. M. Bonilla placed the bodies relatively near to the earth. But when we find out what he called relatively near the earth, birds or bugs or hosts of Super Tamerlane or an army of celestial Richard the Lion, our heresies rejoice anyway. His estimate is of less distance than the moon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> One of them was photographed. Uh, see l'astronomie. 1885, page 349. The photograph shows a long body surrounded by indefinite structures or by the haze of wings or planes in motion. Senor Rico of the Observatory of Palermo writes that November 30th, 1880, at 8.30 o'clock in the morning, he was watching the sun when he saw, slowly traversing its disk, bodies in two long parallel lines and a shorter parallel line. The bodies looked winged to him, but so large were they that he had to think of large birds. He thought of cranes. He consulted ornithologists and learned that the configuration of parallel lines agrees with the flight formation of cranes. This was in 1880. Anybody now living in New York City, for instance, would tell him that also it is a familiar formation of aeroplanes. But because of data of focus and subtended angles, these beings or objects must have been very high. Senor Rico argues that condors have been known to fly three or four miles high and that heights reached by other birds have been estimated at two or three miles. He says that cranes have been known to fly so high that they have been lost to view. Our own acceptance, in conventional terms, is that there is not a bird of this earth that would not freeze to death at a height of more than four miles, that if condors fly three to four miles high, they are birds that are especially adapted to such altitudes. Senor Rico's estimate is that these objects or beings or cranes must have been at least five and a half miles high. So again, they could be birds. Ford is just questioning the ability of birds to fly that high above the surface. I wonder how high they can fly. Yeah. Well, he does say, Senor Rico argues that condors have been known to fly three yeah. or four miles. But these were five and a half Chapter 17. The vast dark thing that looked like a poised crow of unholy dimensions. Assuming that I shall 
ever have any readers, let him or both of them, if I shall ever have such popularity as that, note how dim that bold black datum is at the distance of only two chapters. <laughs> I just had to read that because he's like, if I ever have any readers, let him, that one guy, <laughs> or both of them, if I ever am <laughs> that popular. <laughs> the question, was it a thing or was it the shadow of a thing? This datum is so important to us because it enforces in another field our acceptance that dark bodies of planetary size traverse this solar system. Our position that these things have been seen and also that their shadows have been seen. In Popular Science, Volume 34, Service tells us of a shadow that Schroeder saw in 1788 in the Lunar Alps. First, he saw a light. But then when this re region was illuminated, he saw a round shadow where the light had been. Our own expression that he saw a luminous object near the moon. And then that part of the moon became illuminated and the object was lost to view. But that it's then then its shadow underneath it was seen. Service explains, of course, otherwise he'd not be a professor service. It's a little contest in relative approximations to realness. Professor Service thinks that what Schroeder saw was the round shadow of a mountain in the region that had become lighted. He assumes that Schroeder never looked again to see whether the shadow could be attributed to a mountain. And that's the crux. Conceivably, a mountain could cast a round, and this means detached, shadow in the lighted part of the moon. Professor Service could, of course, explain why he disregards the light in the first place. Maybe it had always been there in the first place. But if he couldn't explain he'd still be an amateur. So that's Fort is a roundabout way of making fun of the idea that a mountain is going to cost, cast an unattached round right. shadow on the surface of the moon. And that he disregards the lighted right. sighting first. Yes. Mr. H. C. Russell, who was usually as orthodox as anybody, I suppose, at least he did write F-R-A-S, or Fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, after his name, tells us in the Observatory, Volume 2, one of the wickedest, most preposterous stories that we have so far exhumed. That he and another astronomer, G.D. Hurst, were in the Blue Mountains near Sydney, New South Wales, and Mr. Hurst was looking at the moon. And he saw on the moon what Russell calls... One of the most one of those remarkable facts which being seen should be recorded, although no explanation can at present be offered. Lashed by the phantom scourge of a now passing era, the world of astronomers is in a state of terrorism, though of a highly attenuated, modernized, devitalized kind. Let an astronomer see something that is not of the conventional celestial sights or something that it is improper to see, and his very dignity is in danger. <laughs> Someone of the crowd and scourge may stick a smile into his back, and he'd be thought of unkindly. <laughs> stick a smile into his back. Yes. They'll be smirking They'll behind smirk him. at him smirk behind, behind his, his back. back. That's right. <laughs> Stab him in the back with a smile. With a hardihood that is unusual in his world of ethereal sensitive to, uh, sensitiveness, sensitivenesses, Russell says of Hearst's observation... He found a large part of it covered with a dark shade, quite as dark as the shadow of the earth during an eclipse of the moon. And one could hardly resist the convic conviction that it was a shadow, yet it could not be the shadow of any known body. So they're talking about an, an enormous circular shadow on the surface of the illuminated moon. That's cool, dude. Ooh. And there, and you know, uh, Professor Russell or whatever is saying it was not the shadow of any known body, right? That is just the teaching. So, we're skipping quite a bit here, but so that is just the teaching of this department of advanced astronomy that Russell and Hearst saw the sun eclipsed relatively to the moon by a vast dark body. That many times have eclipses occurred relatively to this earth by vast dark bodies. That there have been many eclipses that have not been recognized as eclipses by scientific kindergartens. There is a merger, of course. We'll take a look at it first. That, after all, it may have been a shadow that Hearst and Russell saw, but the only significance is that the sun was eclipsed relatively to the moon by a cosmic haze of some kind. So, what they're saying here is that 
something came between the earth, the sun and the moon and ca- cast a shadow onto the moon, which is what they saw. So that's what he means by the sun was eclipsed relative to the moon. Right. <clears throat> Not the earth. Right. Uh, okay, yeah, so there, so it is, the only significance is that the sun was eclipsed relatively to the moon by a cosmic haze of some kind, or a swarm of meteors close together, or a gaseous discharge left behind by a comet. My own acceptance is that vagueness of shadow is a function of vagueness of intervention, that a shadow as dense as the shadow of this earth is cast by a body denser than hazes and swarms. The information seems definite enough in this respect, quote, quite as dark as the shadow of this earth during the eclipse of the moon, right. unquote. So something solid is what he's suggesting. Yes, yeah. right. If we are in harmony with a new dominant or the spirit of a new era in which exclusionism must be overthrown, if we have data of many obscurations that have occurred, not only upon the moon, but upon our own earth as convincing as of, of as convincing of vast intervening bodies usually invisible as is any regularized predicted eclipse one looks up at the sky it seems incredible that say at the distance of the moon there could be but be invisible a solid body say the size of the moon but one looks up at the moon at a time when only a crescent of it is visible The tendency is to build up the rest of it in one's mind, but the unillumined part looks as vacant as the rest of the sky. And it is of the same blueness as the rest of the sky. There is a vast area of solid substance just before one's eyes, but it is indistinguishable from the sky. That's right. That's freaking cool. Yeah. Monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, Volume 8. A remarkable appearance during the total eclipse of the moon on March 19th, 1848. In an extract from a letter from Mr. Forster, it is said that according to the writer's observations at the time of the predicted total eclipse, the moon shone with about three times the intensity of the mean illumination of an eclipsed lunar disk and that the British consul at Ghent, who did not know of the predicted eclipse, had written inquiring as to the blood-red color of the moon. But there follows another letter from another astronomer, Walkie, who who had made observations uh, at St. Lawrence that instead of an eclipse, the moon became, as is printed in italics, most beautifully illuminated and rather tinged with a deep red, the moon being as perfect with light as if there had been no eclipse whatsoever. So they're all watching an eclipse but it actually gets brighter and red during the eclipse. Hmm. Now, I remember we watched a lunar eclipse recently here. Yeah, the wolf moon. Yeah, and the moon turned orangey red. Really yeah. cool. And I that think was that's a product pr- of the... Penum- uh, penumbral? Penumbral. Eclipse? Yeah, it's like... It's the sunlight coming through the Earth's atmosphere causing yes. it to look red. Surely that would have been known about it this time. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but it definitely got darker when I when we watched that eclipse. Yeah. You looking it up? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. But a single instance... So oh, go ahead. Penumbral lunar eclipse takes place when the moon moves through the faint outer part of the Earth's shadow, the penumbra. Okay. This type of eclipse is not as dramatic as other types of lunar eclipses and is often mistaken for a regular full moon. So, uh, let's see. Yeah, basically you're getting the atmospheric... It's, it's like you get the sunset Yeah. cast upon the moon. Yeah. That's Blood why it becomes... Moon. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so we were making fun of it because I couldn't figure out what to call it. Yeah. The wolf blood moon, <laughs> blood wolf moon. Single instances. So an observation by Scott in the Antarctic. The force of this datum lies in my own acceptance, based upon especially looking up this point, that an eclipse nine-tenths of totality has a great effect even though the sky be clouded. Scott in Voyage of the Discovery, Volume 11. 
says, There may have been an eclipse of the sun, September 21st, 1903, as the almanac said, but we should, none of us, have liked to swear to this fact. <laughs> <laughs> In Notes and Queries, there is an account of a darkness in Holland in the midst of a bright day so intense and terrifying that many panic-stricken persons lost their lives stumbling into the canals. In Gentleman's Magazine, Volume 33, a darkness that came upon London in August 19, 1763, was greater than at the Great Eclipse of 1748. However, our preference is not to go so far back for data. For a list of historical dark days, see Humboldt in his Cosmos. In the Monthly Weather Review, March 1886, according to the La Crosse Daily Republican of March 20th, 1886, the darkness or a darkness suddenly settled upon the city of Oshkosh in Wisconsin at 3 p.m. In five minutes, the darkness equaled that of midnight. People in the streets rushing in all directions, horses running away, women and children running into cellars. There is a little modern touch after all, gas meters instead of images and relics of saints. This darkness, which lasted from 8 to 10 minutes, occurred in a day that had been light but cloudy. It passed from west to east, and brightness followed. And then came reports from towns to the west of Oshkosh that the same phenomenon had already occurred there. A wave of total darkness had passed from west to east. Other instances are recorded in the monthly weather review, but as to all of them, we have a sense of being pretty well eclipsed ourselves by the conventional explanation that the obscuring body was only a very dense mass of clouds. But some of the instances are interesting. Intense darkness at Memphis, Tennessee for about 15 minutes at 10 a.m. So because it passed from west to east, it would have had to have been because the body was moving. That's right. In not, our, because, not due to the rotation. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I had to work that out in my brain. Right. A little bit. I thought there might have been a way that... Yeah, I was thinking it too. Is he is he implying that it was in our atmosphere or between us and the sun and it's moving? Whatever. And in other words, we're not spinning past it. It's yeah. actually in motion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. An intense darkness at Memphis in Tennessee for about 15 minutes, 10 a.m., December 2nd, 1904. We are told that in some quarters a panic prevailed and that some were shouting and praying and imagining that the end of the world had come. That's from the Monthly Weather Review, Volume 32. <clears throat> at Louisville in Kentucky, March 7th, 1911, at about 8 a.m., duration about half an hour, it had been raining moderately, and then hail had fallen, but the intense blackness and general ominous appearance of the storm spread terror throughout the city. As to darknesses that have fallen upon vast areas, conventionality is smoke from forest fires. In the U.S. US Forest Service Bulletin, number 117, F.G. Plummer gives a list of 18 darknesses that have occurred in the United States and Canada. He is one of the primitives, but I should say that his dogmatism is shaken by vibrations from the new dominant. His difficulty, which he acknowledges, but which he would have disregarded had he written a decade or so earlier, is the profundity of some of these obscurations. He says that mere smokiness cannot account for such awe-inspiring dark days. However... Of these 18 instances, the only one that I'd bother to contest is the profound darkness in Canada and northern parts of the United States, November 19th, 1819, which we have already considered. Its concomitants, lights in the sky, falls of a black substance, and shocks like those of an earthquake. In this instance, the only available forest fire was one to the south of the Ohio River, for all I know, soot from a very great fire south of the Ohio might fall in Montreal in Canada, and conceivably, by some freak of reflection, light from it might be seen in Montreal. But the earthquake is not assimilable with a forest fire. On the other hand, it will soon be our expression that profound darkness, falls of matter from the sky, lights in the sky, and earthquakes are phenomena of the near approach of other worlds to this world. 
it is such comprehensiveness as contrasted with inclusion of a few factors and disregard for the rest that we call higher approximation to realness or universalness. So there he's saying, if we take that all of these things happen at the same time, then the only way to call them, well, it's smoke or this or that, or, you know, you have to ignore the earthquake or you have to ignore the lights in the sky. Right. So his approxi higher approximation to realness is that we're passing close to other worlds that are not, and for the most part, invisible. There was a darkness. And they would be. Yeah. If they cast a shadow where you where you were. Yeah. Suggests that uh, you're having to look into the sun. Yeah. Towards the sun. Right. To see them, and you're not going to see them in yeah. that case. Yeah, if we're it's seeing like, like if we're a, seeing their dark side, it's going to be blue sky. On the date of a lunar uh, solar eclipse, you can't see the moon, mm. even though it's right there, right next to the sun. Yeah, that's true. All it, all it is all. is a black disc that you well, you it. don't see it until it passes in front of the sun. Yeah, I mean, but it's completely invisible. Mm -hmm. That's right. There was a darkness in 1904 in April at Wimbledon in England. This is from Simmons Meteorological Magazine. It came from a smokeless region. There was no rain, no thunder. It lasted 10 minutes, and it was too dark to go, quote, even out into the open, unquote. As to darknesses in Great Britain, one thinks of fogs, but in Nature, Volume 25, there are some observations by Major J. Herschel upon an obscuration in London, January 22nd, 1882 at 1030 a.m. that was so great that he could hear persons on the opposite side of the street but could not see them, and it was, quote, obvious that there was no fog to speak of, unquote. Annual. Re this is interesting that there have been these these kinds of darknesses in such recent times, like so dark that it's like midnight in the middle of the yeah. day for ten minutes and everyone freaks out. You know, but I bet yeah, yeah, especially if there's no clouds, right? There's no obvious occulting of the sun usually because it's a cloudy day. So it's just cloudy. You can't see the sun anyway, and then suddenly it just gets pitch black, <laughs> and there's no there's not supposed to be. An eclipse that day. Annual Register, 1857. An account by Charles Murray, British envoy to Persia, of a darkness of May 20th, 1857, that came upon Baghdad. Quote, A darkness more intense than ordinary midnight, when neither stars nor moon are visible. Unquote. And, quote, After a short time, the black darkness was succeeded by a red, lurid gloom such as I never saw in any part of the world. Panic seized the whole city, and then a dense volume of red sand fell. Whoa, dude. This matter of sand falling seems to suggest conventional explanation, or that a simoon, simoon, heavily charged with terrestrial sand, had obscured the sun. But Mr. Murray, who says that he had experience with these storms, gives his opinion that it cannot have been a simoon. A sandstorm. So like yeah, a sandstorm. Yeah. If a large substantial mass or superconstruction should enter this Earth's atmosphere, it is our acceptance that it would sometimes, depending on velocity, appear luminous or look like a cloud, or like a cloud with a luminous nucleus. Later, we shall have an expression upon luminosity different from the luminosity of incandescence that comes upon objects falling from the sky or entering this Earth's atmosphere. Now our expression is that worlds have often come close to this Earth and that smaller objects, size of a haystack or size of several dozen skyscrapers lumped, have often hurtled through this Earth's atmosphere and have been mistaken for clouds because they were enveloped in clouds. Or that's around something coming from the intense cold of interplanetary space, that is, of some regions, our own suspicion is that other regions are tropical, the moisture of this Earth's atmosphere would condense into a cloud-like appearance around it. In Nature, Volume 20, there is an account by Mr. S. W. Clifton, collector of customs at Fremantle in Western Australia, sent to the Melbourne, Melbourne Observatory a clear day, 
appearance of a small black cloud moving not very swiftly that burst into a ball of fire of the apparent size of the moon. Man, that's crazy. Finley gives dozens of instances of tornado clouds that seem to me more like solid things covered in clouds than clouds. He notes that in the tornado at Americus in Georgia, July, of eight, July 18th, 1881, a strange sulfurous vapor was emitted from the cloud. In many instances, objects or meteoritic stones that have come from this Earth's externality have had a sulfurous odor. Why a wind effect should be sulfurous is not clear. That a vast object from external regions should be sulfurous is in line with many data. This phenomenon is described in the Monthly Weather Review, July of 1881, as a strange sulfurous vapor burning and sickening all who approached close enough to breathe it. Nature, Volume 7. According to a correspondent to the Birmingham Norm Morning News, the people living near King's Sutton saw about 1 o'clock, December 7th, 1872, something like a haycock hurtling through the air. So I looked this up. A haycock is a conical heap of hay in a field. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you didn't know that. Okay. Like a meteor, it was accompanied by fire and a dense smoke. Uh... And it made a noise like that of a railway train. It was sometimes high in the air and sometimes near the ground. The effect was tornado-like. Trees and walls were knocked down. It's a late day now to try to verify this story, but a list is given of persons whose property was injured. We are told that this thing then disappeared all at once. Okay, so Watcher's given us a list of bird flight heights. Highest one is the bar-headed goose, 27,825 feet. You find out how many miles that is? Yeah, 5.25. 5. 5. 5. 5. 2. 2. 5. Okay. Basically, 2.6, 2. 2.7. 2. So that could have been what that guy saw if he was estimated there were five and a half miles up there. Yeah, or there's the whooper swan, 27,000 feet, alpine cough, <laughs> 26,500 feet. Bearded vulture, 24,000 feet. I mean, there's, yeah, they're, they're way up there. Yeah. And the condor, 21,300 feet, which I think they were talking about. Yeah. 21. The condor is like 24 miles, three. three to four. Yeah, four miles. Yeah. So the so, question is, is. So the bar headed goose is not freezing to death. I guess not. Yeah. But where does it fly? That's the other question. Like, where was this guy making the observations? And yeah, they, I think the reason he was in, in the polar region, like yeah. up north or yeah. more towards the equator. But yeah, but still up there, it's just a lot of it has to do with just the pressure. You know? Yeah. But are they higher than bugs? Can bugs fly that high? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do locusts fly up there? I don't know. All right, well, we're going to take a break. break. Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, final segment here of the show, 237, Book of the Zam, part something. And, uh, part eight, yeah. I think. Oh, yeah. It's it is there. going to be one of the longer book reports. Yeah. All good. Yeah. Gives us something to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, Perry has gone over 15,000 records of earthquakes, and he has correlated many with proximities of the moon, or has attributed many to the pull of the moon when nearest the Earth. Also, there is a paper upon this subject in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Cornwall, 1845, or theoretically, when at its closest to the Earth, 
The moon quakes the face of the earth and is itself quaked, but does not itself fall to this earth. As to showers of matter that may have come from the moon at such times, one can go over old records and find what one pleases. And that is what we shall now do. Our data. We take them from four classes of phenomena that have preceded or accompanied earthquakes. Unusual clouds, darkness profound, luminous appearances in the sky, and falls of substances and objects, whether commonly called meteoritic or not. Or is it the other way around? That the earthquake is accompanying some fall of something. Yeah. What What's the difference? What do you mean? What's the difference? To there? say that um, some darkness or some fall accompanies an earthquake. I mean, it implies like, the earthquake implies is that, the cause. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. It's like, like he had mentioned before that it was some close pass of a external body. Yeah that the earthquake would have been the result of that, yeah. not the other way around, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, the so, earthquake is the result, but so are also the falls and the yeah, darknesses yeah, yeah. and the luminous lights in the sky and stuff. Yeah, so I wouldn't, if, if we were looking at data and we saw, okay, here's earthquakes and darknesses and falls all happening together, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say... Well, the darknesses and falls are accompanying these earthquakes. It just seems to be the yeah, other way around. Right. Me. How could an earthquake cause that? Yeah, I think that's his point okay. for sure. I think that, that is what he's trying to point out is that you can have an earthquake and you can have dark clouds and things falling from the sky. But when you have these things together, this implies, this seems to imply something more than just chance. Yeah. Not one of these occurrences fits in with principles of primitive or primary seismology. And every one of them is a datum of a quake to body passing close to this earth or suspended over it. To the primitives, there is not a reason in the world why a convulsion of this earth's surface should be accompanied by unusual sights in the sky, by darkness, or by the falls of substances or objects from the sky. As to phenomena like these or storms preceding earthquakes, the irreconcil uh, irreconcilability is still greater. It was before 1860 that Perry made his great compilation. We take most of our data from lists compiled long ago. Only the safe and unpainful have been published in recent years, at least in ambitious and voluminous form. The restraining hand of the system, as we call it, whether it has any real existence or not, is tight upon the sciences of today. <laughs> so I included that last part because it's interesting here during this particular section of the book, Fort is pointing out uh, that he notices the the fall, falling away of these kinds of reports and that there's a timeline. And he attributes it to the system clamping down. Hmm. Right here he says, the monthly weather review is still a rich field of unfaithful observation but in looking over other long-established periodicals, I have noted their glimmers of quasi-individuality -individual fade gradually after about 1860 and the surrender of their attempt attempted identities to a higher attempted organization. Hmm. Some of them expressing intermediateness-wide intermediateness -wide endeavor to localize the universal or to localize self, soul, identity, and entity or positiveness and realness held out until as far as 1880, and there are traces findable up to 1890. So he's just implying there that, you know, these all these different journals, when you're reading them, the older versions, they have, uh, they have their own feel, their own identity. They're different from the other periodicals, mm -hmm. but the closer you get to the 1900s, the more they all start to sound the same, wow. and they lose their individual identity that made them worth looking at before yeah. now you can basically just read the monthly weather review and you got them all uh, and bad. even even the monthly weather review he said was a rich field of unfaithful observation yeah. until about 1860 it fades gradually 
After the death of Richard Proctor, whose occasional illiberalities I'd not like to emphasize too much, all succeeding volumes of knowledge have yielded scarcely a single unconventionality. Note the great number of times that the American Journal of Science and the report of the British Association are quoted in here. Note that after, say, 1885, they're scarcely mentioned in these inspired but illicit pages. As by hypnosis and inertia, we keep on saying, right around 1880, they throttle in disregard. But the coercion could not be positive, and many of the excommunicated continue to creep in, or even to this day, some of the strangled are faintly breathing. <laughs> So we begin with Robert Mallet's catalog in the report of the British Association in 1852, omitting, omitting some extraordinary instances because they occurred before the 18th century. And he's joked multiple times throughout the book that that's his own exclusion. He tries not to go back before the 18th century mm. for his data. Earthquake preceded by a violent tempest in England, January 8th, 1704, preceded by a bi brilliant meteor in Switzerland, November 4th, 1704, a luminous cloud moving at high velocity, disappearing behind the horizon in Florence, December 9th, 1731. There were thick mists in the air through which a dim light was seen, and several weeks before the shock, globes of light had been seen in the air. So again, this is just a huge list. A rain of earth in France, October 18th, 1731. There was a black cloud in London, March 19th, 1750. A violent storm and a strange star of octagonal shape in Norway, April 15th, 1752. Balls of fire from a streak in the sky in 1752. Numerous meteorites in Lisbon, October 15th, 1755. Terrible tempests over and over. Falls of hail and brilliant meteors, instance after instance. There was an immense globe in Switzerland, November 2nd, 1761. An oblong sulfurous cloud in Germany, April 1767. An extraordinary mass of vapor uh, in April 1780 in Boulogne. Uh, Boulogne. Uh, heavens obscured by a dark mist in Granada, Ab August 7th, 1804. And strange howling noises in the air and large spots obscuring the sun in Italy, April 16th, 1817. And a luminous meteor moving in the same direction as the shock in Naples, November 22nd, 1821. And a fireball appearing in the sky, apparently the size of the moon, November 29th, 1831. So all of these are alongside of earthquakes. Wow. In the Edinburgh New Philosophical Journal... We have to go way back to 1841, days of less efficient strangulation. Sir David Milne lists phenomena of quakes in Great Britain, and I pick out a few that indicate to me that other worlds were near this Earth's surface. A violent storm before a shock of 1703, and a ball of fire preceding one in 1750. A large ball of fire seen upon the day following a quake in 1755. Uncommon phenomenon in the air, a large luminous body bent like a crescent, which stretched itself over the heavens in 1816, and a vast ball of fire in 1750, black rains and black snows, 1755, numerous instances of upward projection or upward attraction, perhaps, during quakes, preceded by a cloud, very black and lowering, 1795, and a fall of black powder preceding a quake by six hours in 1837. Upward projection, what, is, what does it mean? There? Things being thrown or hurled up in the air during the quake in such a way that it seems strange. Hmm. Like an impact, like throwing stuff up in the air. Yeah, well, Ford, of course, implies that gravity's doing something weird. Ah. <laughs> so he says, I'm beginning to modify that at a distance from this earth, gravitation has more effect than we have supposed, though less effect than the dogmatists suppose and prove. I'm coming out stronger for the acceptance of a neutral zone, that this earth, like other magnets, has a neutral zone, in which is the super sargasso sea, and in which other worlds may be buoyed up through projecting parts, though projecting, projecting parts may be subject to this Earth's attraction. Now, I just wanted to point that out because he's right. We have Lagrange points, which are neutral zones of gravitation. These are known. And yes, if you want to think of Fort Super Sargasso Sea somewhere out in space, like the, uh, uh, the 
uh, Lagrange, Lagrange point is a perfect point, place yeah. for like stuff to just hang out Collect, yeah. in relatively zero motion relative to the Earth. You know, that could fall down here if something perturbs it. Yeah, and there are uh, strange, like, gravitational phenomena, like you were pointing out. Uh, I don't remember what the topic was, but it was like there's these like hills. In the yeah. ocean, yes, yeah, or dips in the <laughs> yeah. ocean. Then you got to climb back out of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is strange. Yes, yeah, that was in one of Ivan T. Sanderson's books. And there's these, you know, they're they're monitoring these gigantic, dense globs yep. in the mantle. Yep, that I guess could be responsible for some of that. Yeah, uh, some of the gravitational anomalies that yeah. are that are noticed on the surface. Then there are many other instances that indicate proximity of other worlds during earthquakes. I note a few. Quake, an object in the sky called a large luminous meteor from the quarterly journal of the Royal Institute, volume 5. A luminous body in the sky and an earthquake and a fall of sand in Italy, February 12th and 13th in 1870. Many reports upon luminous object in the sky and earthquake in Connecticut in 1883 from the Monthly Weather Review. A luminous object or meteor in the sky and a fall of stones from the sky and earthquake in Italy in 1891. An earthquake and a large number of luminous bodies or globes in the air in France, 1779. An earthquake at Manila, 1863. And curious luminous appearance in the sky. The most notable appearance of fishes during an earthquake is that of Rio Bamba. Humboldt sketched one of them, and it is an uncanny-looking thing. Thousands of them appeared on the ground during this tremendous earthquake. <laughs> Humboldt says that they were cast up from subterranean sources. <laughs> I think not myself, and I have data for thinking not, but there'd be such a row arguing back and forth that it's simpler to consider a clearer instance of the fall of living fishes from the sky during an earthquake. I can't quite accept myself whether a large lake... And all the fishes in it was torn down from some other world or a lake in the Super Sargasso Sea, distracted between two pulling worlds and was dragged down to this earth. But here are the data. February 16th, 18, 1861, an earthquake in Singapore. Then came an extraordinary downpour of rain, or as much water as any good-sized lake would consist of. For three days, this rain or this fall of water came down in torrents. In pools on the ground formed by this deluge, great numbers of fishes were found. The writer says that he had himself seen nothing but water fall from the sky. Whether I'm emphasizing what a deluge it was or not, he says also that so terrific had been the downpour that he had not been able to see three steps away from him. But the natives in the area said that the fishes had fallen from the sky. Three days later, the pools dried up and many dead fishes were found, but... In the first place, though that's an expression for which we have a distinctive dislike, <laughs> the fishes had been active and uninjured. Then follows material for another of our little studies in the phenomena of disregard. A psychotropism here is mechanically to take pen in hand and mechanically write that fishes found on the ground after a heavy rainfall came from overflowing streams. The writer of the account says that some of the fishes had been found in his courtyard, which was surrounded by high walls. But paying no attention to this, a correspondent explains that in the heavy rain, a body of water had probably overflowed, carrying the fishes with it. We are told by the first writer that these fishes of Singapore were of a species that was very abundant near Singapore. So I think myself that a whole lakeful of them had been shaken down from the Super Sargasso Sea under the circumstances we have thought of. However, if appearance of strange fishes after an earthquake be more pleasing in the sight or to the nostrils of the new dominant, we faithfully and piously su supply that incense. An account of the occurrence at Singapore was read before the French Academy, and it was recalled that upon a former occasion, it had been submitted to the Academy, the circumstance that fishes of a new species had appeared at the Cape of Good Hope after an earthquake. Huh. So I love that. You got an earthquake, and then it rains fish, and... 
Now, yeah, could it be a coincidence? But again, Ford is constantly saying, you know, this book is an exercise in overworked coincidence. <laughs> it is an interesting idea to think, though, that there could be some kind of fish living in the aquifer, mm -hmm. like some blind fish or mm -hmm. something. Yep. You have this earthquake and it just rips it open and yeah, all blows these, out all this all water these, with all yeah. these fish yeah. that no one's ever seen before and they're yeah. all strange looking. Yep. In the Canadian Institute proceedings, there is an account by the deputy commissioner, uh, commissioner at Dermsala of the extraordinary Dermsala meteorite, which was coated with ice. But the combination of events related by him is still more extraordinary. That within a few months of the fall of this meteorite, there had been a fall of live fishes and a shower of red substance and a dark spot observed on the disk of the sun and an earthquake and an unnatural darkness of some duration and a luminous appearance in the sky that looked like an aurora borealis. <laughs> but there's more to this climax. We are introduced to a new order of phenomena, visitors. The deputy commissioner writes that in the evening after the fall of the Dermsala meteorite, or mass of stone covered with ice, he saw lights, and some of them were not very high, and they appeared and went out and reappeared. Hmm. Now, earthquake lights is, I don't know if I would say it's a known thing, but this is, this does happen. That there is some kind of strange electrical discharge happening around earthquakes, maybe it's Shows up as ball lightning. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, earthquake, earthquake lights is a, is a thing. I don't know, though, but like, the, <laughs> I love that this list. Yeah. Uh, a fall of fishes, a shower of red substance, dark spot on the disk of the sun, an earthquake, an unnatural darkness, a luminous appearance in the sky that looked like an aurora borealis. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> so... Some object comes in like a cometary chunk. It gets broken up by the sun. Part of it falls into the sun, mm -hmm. creates a giant massive storm on the sun, oh, yeah, yeah. and it blows a CME out, yeah. which comes towards us, and then other pieces of it fall yeah. on the earth, and some of them land in the water and throw fishes up. <laughs> some of it lands on the earth. <laughs> and then we get hit by a CME, and we get the northern lights, and yeah. there's all these kind of weird rains yeah. and stuff from where the... And, the, and, a, and a sunquake. Yeah. Because the CME causes the earthquake, too. Yeah. Yeah. All right, mystery, mystery solved. solved. <laughs> Next mystery. <laughs> Next mystery. <laughs> <laughs> the writer says that the lights moved like fire balloons, but, quote, I am sure that they were neither fire balloons, nor lanterns, nor bonfires, nor any other thing of that sort, but bona fide lights in the heavens, unquote. It's a subject for which we shall have to have a separate expression. Trespassers upon territory to which something else has legal right. Perhaps someone lost a rock and he and his friends came down looking for it in the evening. Or secret agents or emissaries who had an appointment with certain esoteric ones near Dermsala. Things or beings coming down to explore and unable to stay down long. In a way, another strange occurrence during an earthquake is suggested. The ancient Chinese tradition... The marks like hoof marks in the ground. We have thought with a low degree of acceptance of another world that may be in secret communication with certain esoteric ones of this earth, earth's inhabitants and of messages in symbols like hoof marks that are sent to some receptor or a special hill upon this earth and of messages that at times miscarry. So that's going all the way back to the cut marks. But yeah, I just love how he just throws in there like maybe these were... People sneaking in during all this chaos. Yeah. They're like, oh, man, they, they just got hit by a meteor and there's some earthquakes. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> they won't detect us. That's right. <laughs> we lost our rock. It's the meteor. <laughs> by the way, dump these fish. We don't want them anymore. Yeah, yeah, get rid of these fish. <laughs> it is said that in an earthquake in Calabria, paving stones shot up far into the air. The writer doesn't specifically say that they came down again, but something seems to tell me that they did. And in there are the corpses of Riobamba. Rio Humboldt reported that in the quake of Riobamba, 
quote, bodies were torn upward from graves, unquote, and that, quote, the vertical motion was so strong that bodies were tossed several hundred feet into the air, unquote. And then there's the key. What about the caskets? I don't, I don't know. It should have been a raining caskets. <laughs> Yeah, it should have been studied by that professor. And headstones. And Coffin stuff. that was... Uh, yeah, that Professor we talked Coffin. Co yeah. Professor Coffin should have just studied the uh, reigning caskets. Then there's the key of Libsyn, or Lisbon. We are told that it went down. A vast throng of persons ran to the key for refuge. The city of Lisbon was in profound darkness. The key and all the people on it disappeared. If it and they went down... Not a single corpse, not a shred of clothing, not a plank of the key, nor so much as a splinter of it ever floated to the surface. What is the key? What's Like a harbor, oh, okay. a key, a bay. You know, it's spelled Q-U-A-Y, but they, I think it's pronounced key. Okay. So, yeah, apparently there's a, there was an earthquake in Lisbon. During a profound darkness, and everybody ran down to the key, and then it sank, but no parts of it ever surfaced in the water. It's a strange, and he just throws it's it not in an there. Island, like Florida Keys. I don't think so. Let me. Yeah. A concrete, stone, or metal platform lying alongside or projecting into water for loading and unloading ships. A structure built parallel to the bank of a waterway for use as a landing place. Yeah, and it's pronounced key. Or qu quay? I don't know. A wharf is another word for it. Okay. Did they build another one? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Skipping a whole chapter here because he's going off on positivists. Maybe we'll cover some of that in a um, Patreon. And going to chapter 19, where he says he has industriously sought data for an expression upon birds. <laughs> but he says, there was a tremendous red rain in France, October 16th and 17th, 1846, and a great storm at the time, and red rain supposed to have been colored by matter swept up from this Earth's surface and then precipitated. But the description of this red rain differs from one's impressions of red, red, sandy, or muddy water. It was said that this red rain was so vividly red and so blood-like that many persons in France were terrified. Two analyses are given. One chemist notes a great quantity of corpuscles. <laughs> Whether blood-like or not, is, uh, are, we're in the rain. The other chemist sets down organic matter at 35%. So there, uh, I don't know why he throws that in there. All, we're getting nearer to the end of the book, and we're all the way back to blood rain. Mm -hmm. But he says, I have notes upon other birds. So now we're back to the birds. <laughs> <laughs> that have fall uh, okay, I know why he's talking about it now, I remember. This has to do with earthquakes still? No, I think he's wondering if birds are being destroyed in the sky. Oh, okay. And then it rains, it rains blood. blood. Yeah. I have notes upon other birds that have fallen from the sky, but they were unaccompanied by the red rain that makes the fall of birds in France peculiar, and very peculiar, if it be accepted that the red substance was extra mundane. The other notes are upon birds that have fallen from the sky in the midst of storms, or of exhausted but living birds falling not far from a storm area. But now we shall have an instance for which I can find no parallel. A fall of dead birds from a clear sky far distant from any storm to which they could be attributed, so remote from any discoverable storm. In the Monthly Weather Review, May 1917, W. L. McCatty quotes from the, Bat, uh, the Baton Rouge correspondence to the Philadelphia Times that in the summer of 1896, into the streets uh, and from a clear sky fell hundreds of dead birds. There were wild ducks and catbirds and woodpeckers and many birds of a strange plumage, some of them resembling canaries. 
Usually one does not have to look very far from any place to learn of a storm, but the best that could be done in this instance was to say, well, there had been a storm on the coast of Florida. But of course, these birds fell in Louisiana. Wasn't there something we had talked about before where flocks of birds would just suddenly like turn down and dive out of the sky? Dive. Yeah, but yeah. these were these were dead before they hit the ground. This yeah, is why but it's what weird. was the cause about those? Oh, people speculate that it's some magnetic field problem. Mm. So I wonder if some some huge fluctuation in the magnetic field just caused them all to have aneurysms and mm. kill them or something. I don't know. But they have little compasses in their brains yeah. by what were they? What did they call it? The weird magnetic particles. Yeah, <laughs> magnets. I don't remember. <laughs> it was a cool word. Yeah, whatever yeah. it was. <laughs> in the Scientific American, Volume Thirty Three, there is an account of some hay that fell from the sky. From the circumstances, we incline to accept that this hay went up in a whirlwind from this Earth in the first place reached the Super Sargasso Sea and remained there a long time before falling. An interesting point in this expression is the usual attribution to a local and coinciding whirlwind and the identification of it. And Cryptochrome. Then, cryptochrome. That's it. <laughs> That's right. Thanks, Watcher. We need, we need more cryptochrome. I need, I need extra cryptochrome in yes, my brain. Yes, I'd love to have extra cryptochrome. Uh... Okay, so an interesting point in this expression is the usual attribution to a local and coinciding whirlwind and an identification of it, and then data that make that local whirlwind unacceptable. Upon July 27th, 1875, small masses of damp hay fell at Monkstown in Ireland. In the Dublin Daily Express, Dr. J.W. Moore explained, he had found a nearby whirlwind to the south of Monkstown that coincided, but according to the Scientific American... A similar fall of hay had occurred near Wrexham, England, two days before. Hmm. Cosmos, Volume 3. Upon the 10th of April, 1869, at uh, Autriche, I don't know, in France, a great number of oak leaves, an enormous segregation of them, fell from the sky on a very calm day. There was so little wind that the leaves fell vertically. And the fall lasted 10 minutes. In La Nature, 1889, upon April 19th, 1889, dried leaves of different species, oak, elm, etc., fell from the sky. This day, too, was a calm day, and the fall was tremendous. The leaves were seen to fall for 15 minutes, but judging from the quantity on the ground, it is the writer's opinion that they had already been falling for half an hour. I think that the geyser of corpses that sprang from Rio Bamba towards the sky must have been an interesting sight. If I were a painter, I'd like that subject. But this cataract of dried leaves, too, is a study in the rhythms of the dead. <clears throat> in this datum, the point most agreeable to us is the very point that the writer in La Nature emphasizes, windlessness. He says that the surface of the river was absolutely smooth, but it was strewn with leaves as far as he could see. In L'Astronomie, 1894, upon the 7th of April, 1894, dried leaves fell at Clairvaux in France. The fall is described as prodigious, and it fell for half an hour. And then upon the 11th, the fall of dried leaves occurred at Pont Carré. I wonder if they ever figured out where the, like, where the trees indigenous to the area, you know, were there, were there forests of these trees nearby, or were they... Yeah, that's a good question. But uh, we're uh, we're approaching the end here. All right. Well, there's more leaves, blood red skies, seeds, lots more stuff coming up. And uh, some of these falls of leaves, there there shouldn't be a source. That so Fort points out that like you know if you look at the time of year when the leaves fall. They seem to be last year's autumn leaves. Oh, man. Like, they've been up there for... Exactly. <laughs> they got blown up in there. And, and they're falling in spring up. of yeah. the next year. <laughs> exactly. Well, you do, have, uh, you do have a fall of leaves in the spring. 
and they're the winter leaves yeah. of like evergreens. Well, they'll drop those leaves. Yeah. That they, they're winter leaves, I guess. I'm pretty sure. And then they grow new ones mm. for the season. Yeah. We have a bunch of leaves out here right now. Yeah. They're all. They're drying up. Yeah. Yeah. They're all falling around. So. All right. Cool stuff. We got, uh, Got some Patreon producers, end of the month Patreon producers for this show, episode 237. We have uh, Peter Shell, Zachariah Baker, and Frank M are all executive producers for this show. Thank you guys so much. They're supporting us in the amount of $72 a month on Patreon. And then associate executive producers, we've got Daniel Gandhi and Dave Cortez and Patrick Hicks. The patron saint, uh, the patron saint. <laughs> all supporting us at forty three twenty uh, per month on Patreon. Thank you guys so much, and we'll put you in the show notes as executive and associate executive producers for episode two thirty seven of the Brothers of the Serpent podcast. And uh, all happy the- birthday, Jeff! And happy birthday, Jeff! Yes, the man from the flying saucer. You guys can get a hold of us, Brothers of the Serpent at gmail uh, check out the website, brothersoftheserpent.com, for all the podcast-related stuff, including joining the Pyramid Scheme and support us on Patreon or through PayPal, whichever is your choice. Or, you know, we can you, we accept crypto, whatever shit coin you want to send. Let me know. Uh, give us reviews wherever you can. Thank you so much to all of you who have done that. I see lots of reviews rolling in. And uh, check out the Discord. You can also find a connect button for that on the website. Just click on the Discord link and then hit the connect button and you will be expected to pass a test to be able to be hatched. Answer these questions three. That's right. You must answer three questions. Uh, And that is run by Jeff, whose birthday it is, the Saucer Man, (laughs) who is also known as the Curator (laughs) and Jeff of the Iron Fist. So don't cross him. Don't make him mad in the Discord. Be nice in the chat. That's right. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much. We love you. Always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. Mm-hmm.